Normally I have you turn to one passage of scripture and we just pick our way through that one passage of scripture. Today I'm going to be looking at a bunch of passages of scripture. I want to kind of paint a big picture idea here today. So I'm going to be looking at a bunch of passages. So they'll be on the screen, but if you want to follow along with your Bible, I'll call them out as we get there. I'm going to start in 2 Corinthians 2.11 if you want to turn there. Uh, we'll get there in a minute. Then we'll look at a bunch of others. So while you look for 2 Corinthians 2.11, let me pray for us again. Father, again, we thank you that you've gathered us together here this morning. We are your people and you are our God. And we are amazed and humbled to be in your presence. And now, Lord, we ask that you speak to us through these passages. Some of these passages are passages that we don't look at very often. And so, Lord, come and have your way and come speak to us here this morning through these passages. And as always, we invite the power of the presence of the Holy Spirit to be with us because we know that as the Holy Spirit is with us, there can be no spirit of distraction in the room. And we know that as the Holy Spirit is with us, there can be no spirit of doubt or confusion in the room. Only the Holy Spirit can speak and move, and we do invite you, Holy Spirit, to come and to have your way and to do what you need to do with us this morning. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good thing I'm going to turn off your microphone first. We'll get you back. <clears throat> All right. Today I want to talk about, you know, I labeled it that I want to talk about spiritual warfare. But as I was looking at my notes this morning, I thought, you know what? I'm really talking about the sneaky ways the devil attacks us. It's spiritual warfare, but he can be really sneaky sometimes. And so I want to talk about some of the sneaky ways that the devil attacks us. Now, I don't want to focus on the devil. I normally like to focus my messages on the person of Jesus. But we do have an enemy that is out to harm us, and so we must be aware of his tactics and what he does. In fact, Paul urges us to be aware of the enemy's schemes. Stephen, put up that second Corinthians one, please. 2 Corinthians 2.11, in order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. I love that, don't you? That is great. Now the word, the Greek word that's translated here is outwit, means to be taken advantage of. Paul doesn't want us to be taken advantage of by the plans of the devil, because we're not unaware of his schemes. I love the way he states that. We are not unaware of his schemes, so we're not going to be outwitted. He's, he's stating that as a fact. We know the devil's schemes, and so we won't be outwitted. But I had to scratch my head and think to myself, well, in our day and age, 2,000 years removed from Paul, do we know the schemes of the devil? So that's kind of what I wanted to take a look at. But in the end, this is all about Jesus because Jesus gives us the victory over all of those schemes of the enemy, right? Now, I have taken this verse slightly out of context for my opening point. But I am going to come back to the context that it's in and explain the context that that verse sits in, okay? So I'm not being exegetically incorrect today. All right, I, as we set the stage for this message, I want to look at a couple other verses real quick. And then we'll get into some of the sneaky attacks of the devil. Stephen put up John 10.10. 10. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Jesus is saying this about the devil, right? Now, this is a good litmus test. How do we know if the devil is working stuff in our life? How do we know if he's been penetrating into our life and doing stuff? Because there's stealing, killing, and destroying going on. Now, we can't always think about this as literal killing and stealing, right? Do you still have joy? Do you still have peace? Are the relationships in your family still functioning well? Because if they're not, we can say that the devil has been stealing and killing and destroying in our life, right? So when you look at your, this can be a litmus test. As you look at your life and you see, you see too much stealing, killing, and destroying going on, the devil's been at work in your life. Here's another one that I want to look at. 1 Peter 5.8. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Do you know how lions in Africa mark their territory? By roaring. A male lion marks his geographic territory by roaring. All other lions hear this and said, don't go there. But it's, it's all roar and no bite, so to speak. And so the devil roams around roaring, trying to mark his territory. But he doesn't have our best intentions at heart because he's looking to devour us. That doesn't sound very good, does it? I love how this verse starts, though. 
Be self-controlled and alert, it says in my older version of the NIV. In the Greek, it says, be of sound judgment and watch. Be of sound judgment and watch. So we've got the passage from Paul in 2 Corinthians. We've got John 10.10 10 from Jesus. And here we have Peter in 5.8 saying, guys, look out for what the devil is doing. Keep your eyes open. So I think it's an important thing for us to consider, right? Now here's the thing, the devil doesn't show up at our door and announce himself and say that he's there to destroy us, right? And then say, okay, I'm going to give you a few minutes to get ready. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? I mean, it would make it easier, wouldn't it? No, the devil's attacks can be very subtle and oftentimes very slow and deliberate. Sometimes we don't even sense the attack until there's already consequences. It's kind of like the frog in the kettle. You know, if you put a frog in a pot and turn on the heat, he'll never jump out. Sometimes it works that way with the devil. He just keeps putting the screws on us and all of a sudden it's too late and we're in a bad place, right? This is why it's important for us to make ourselves aware of what his schemes are and what they look like. To use sound judgment and to watch, as Peter calls us to. So I want to start with the idea of prayer. How can the devil attack our prayer? I'm going to start with a really big, extreme biblical example, and then we'll get a little more practical and talk about what it might look like for everyday life. For our really big, extreme example, I want to go to Daniel 10. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a revelation was given to Daniel, who was also called Belshazzar. Its message was true, and it concerned a great war. The understanding of the message came to him in a vision. At that time, Daniel mourned for three weeks. I ate no choice food, no meat or wine, touched my lips, and I used no lotions until the three weeks were over. On the 24th day of the first month, I was standing on the bank of the great river, the Tigris. I looked up, and there before me was a man dressed in linen with a belt of the finest gold around his waist. His body was like chrysolite, his face like shining, like lightning, his eyes like flaming torches. His arms and legs gleam of bronze, burnished bronze, and his voice like the sound of a multitude. That'd be kind of cool. Daniel was the only one who saw the vision. The men with me did not see it. But such terror overwhelmed them that they fled and hid themselves. So Daniel is the only one that can see this angel, but it changed the atmosphere. I talk about atmosphere all the time. The angel changed the atmosphere so much, all his companions run and hide in fear. So I was left alone, gazing at this great vision. I had no strength left. My face turned deathly pale, and I was helpless. I wonder how he knew that, that his face turned pale, because they didn't have mirrors back then. <laughs> then I heard him speaking, and I listened to him. I fell into a deep sleep, my face to the ground. A hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. He said, Daniel, you who are highly esteemed, consider carefully the words I'm about to speak to you, and stand up, for I have been sent to you. And when he said this, I stood up trembling. Then he continued, do not be afraid, Daniel, since the first day you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come in response to them. But the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief priests, came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. Now I have come to explain to you what will happen to your people in the future, for the vision concerns a time yet to come. While he was saying this to me, I bowed down with my face to the ground and was speechless. Do you see the attack on prayer in there? So this passage starts, verses 1 and 2. Daniel has this great vision and he's greatly disturbed by the vision, right? Verse 3, Daniel starts to pray and fast for three weeks. After he saw this vision, he goes into a time of three weeks of intense praying and fasting, right? In the verses 4 and 5, on day 24 of praying, he has another vision, but this time there is a spirit being in front of him, an angel. I want to look at verse 12 a little more carefully. Stephen, go to verse 12. 
So then he continued, Do not be afraid, Daniel, since the first day that you have set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come in response to them. What I think is so incredible here is it says that from the first day Daniel began to pray, the Lord heard his prayer. Daniel's been waiting 24 days, but his prayers were heard from day one. I think there's a promise here. God hears our prayers right away. The angel says, your prayers were heard from the moment you first began to pray them. So God hears our prayers right away. Then the angel says that he came in response to those prayers. I think we see another promise here. Sometimes, sometimes, God might send an angel in response to our prayers. That's kind of cool. Mm -hmm. But then verse 13. But since the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days, then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. This gets really interesting now, doesn't it? On his way to reach Daniel, Daniel, if you try to say Daniel and angel at the same time, it comes out danger. On the way to reach Daniel, the angel is detained. Now, this is one way that we know for sure it's an angel and not Jesus himself or the Holy Spirit, because they would not have been detained. But this angel must have been a, a minor angel. Maybe he was still a private or something in the God's <laughs> army. And he gets detained by this other being. What's interesting is there does seem to be a three-day gap here. I'm not sure if there was a three-day waiting period before the angel continued on his journey or what, but... God heard Daniel's prayers from day, day one, and he responds by sending an angel. The last couple of weeks, we had looked at some Old Testament passages where God sent the prophet in response to the people, right? And I always say, God doesn't immediately fix the problem. He would dispatch a prophet to see if the people would listen to the prophet. Here, God doesn't immediately fix the problem. He dispatch, dispatches an angel. I love that about God. But he waited 21 days. No, the angel was detained. God didn't wait. Okay, okay. Yes. Right? The angel had to pull out his sword and fight for 21 days. Yeah. Well, the, the angel was losing the battle. He had to call for help, which is what we're getting to. So God heard Daniel's prayer from day one. He responds by saying an angel, but that angel is detained by the prince of the Persian kingdom. So now we have to ask, well, what is the prince of the Persian kingdom? Well, it's a territorial demonic spirit. Several times in the New Testament, Jesus refers to Satan as the prince of this world. So this is similar language to what we see Jesus use, okay? Jesus calls Satan the prince of this world. Jesus even describes the Satan, the prince, as having a form of authority and rule. But what's really interesting here in this verse, at the beginning of the verse, it says the prince of the Persian kingdom... At the end, it says the king of Persia. And I looked up the word in Hebrew that's translated here at the end as king, and it's plural. And I looked in several of the English translations, popular English translations, several of them pick up on that and they say kings. So it appears that there may have been more than one of these demonic spirits. And for sure, they were assigned to the king of Persia. Now, let this sink in for a minute. The king of Persia had at least one demonic spirit assigned to him. Might that explain things about our world today? Sometimes we're fighting the wrong thing, aren't we? We think it's a certain ideology that's wrong. Maybe there's a demonic spirit assigned to those leaders. Now, the prince here is a territorial spirit sent by Satan to rule over this part of the world, Persia. Now, remember the vision that Daniel had related to the kingdom of Persia. God was showing Daniel what was about to happen in the kingdom, kingdom of Persia. In the beginning verse that he read, it said there was war coming. This was not a godly kingdom, of course, because it was ruled and influenced by a demonic spirit. Let that sink in for a minute. The demonic prince of this area doesn't want this message delivered, right? So God dispatches an angel to come answer Daniel's prayer. 
And the demonic territorial spirit sees that and goes, whoa, I got to stop this. And he goes and he wrestles with that angel to stop God from answering Daniel's prayer. Because the message was one of judgment, which would hopefully lead to repentance. So the angel was coming to speak to Daniel. Daniel would speak to the people. And then hopefully the people would repent, which would stop the demonic activity of the spirit. And so the spirit is resisting Daniel. So that the people can't repent. Could the same be true today? <coughs> Excuse me. So it is within the realm of possibilities. Notice how I said that. It is within the realm of possibilities that demonic spirits could be standing in the way of our prayers. It could be within the realm of possibility that what troubles our world today is demonic spirits controlling territories. Amen. Now, of course, there could be many other reasons, but for the sake of time, we won't get into those today. But this idea that there could be demonic spirits resisting our prayers or demonic spirits Controlling territories is especially important to keep in mind as we pray for the big things of the kingdom. Praying for the lost. Praying to reach and transform our community. Praying for the church, the church to grow. Praying for cities and nations. If we set our hearts to pray that nations get saved, do you think there might be resistance to that? Thank you. And here's the thing. Daniel didn't know this was going on. He sets out to pray, and he prays for 24 days, and then the angel shows up and says, oh, by the way, I, I got detained. Sorry, I, I, there's this demon over here that helped me up. <laughs> so we can be praying and praying and praying and wondering, why are we not seeing any growth? Why are we not seeing anything happen here? It's within the realm of possibility that there are demonic spirits, territorial spirits that are resisting us. Okay? So what do we do about this? Well, for one, we don't ever confront these spirits directly or individually. There was a great book written about that a number of years ago. John Paul Jackson wrote a book, I think, called Needless Casualties of War. Don't take on territorial spirits by yourself. They can resist an angel of God. So we're not going to go take on those things by ourselves. We would need to take them on in large community with churches working together with good wisdom on that, okay? Now back to verse 13 here. And then Micah, one of the chief priests, Chief princes, sorry, came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. Well, it says Michael, one of the chief princes, who is, of course, the archangel Michael, right? Of course, we see Michael in other places in scripture. But he comes to rescue this angel sent to Daniel. I would have loved to see what that battle looks like, don't you? Yeah. Archangel Michael comes to deal with this territorial demonic spirit. I bet that spirit got crushed. <laughs> but again, this time it's identified as a king. In plural, kings. So there might have been more than one spirit, and they were certainly assigned to the king of Persia. That's just sobering when I think about that. How many demonic spirits have been assigned to the United States? Or fill in the blank. What nation do you want to put in there? What's Persia doing today? Right? Persia is not a very peaceful place today either, is it? We can certainly ask Jesus to remove these demonic spirits that are in our way. And if we feel strongly led to that way, we could certainly ask God to send more help. Jesus, send Michael, send something. Our, our prayers are getting held up here. But at the very least, we have to realize that the battle that happens when we pray is much bigger than we usually see or realize. Daniel's prayer sets off a rather epic spiritual battle, and one that Daniel was not immediately aware of. I'm reminded of a story. Many years ago, we had this woman that visited our church, and she was not a believer. I had met her in the context of counseling. We had a counseling service renting space from us in the church at the time, and I had met her through the counseling service, and she came to church one Sunday. And again, she's not a believer. And after the service, she told my wife Amy, she goes, yeah, I really couldn't pay attention to that guy up front that was talking. 
because I was watching the battle on the scene and there were two armies on the scene that were fighting each other. She could see it. She could see into the spirit realm and she could see the battle of two armies on the scene. So even here right now in this room with me preaching the word of God, there's a battle going on that we don't see. That's why Wednesdays are so important. Yes, thank you. That's why we pray on Wednesday nights, right? I'm good, thanks. <clears throat> All right. Now let's get practical for a minute. Most likely our everyday prayers aren't going to be held up by territorial spirits. Remember, Daniel was praying for the nation. But we do know that the enemy has great power to try and stop our prayers. The enemy will probably attack our prayers through something more mundane like distractions. Right? If you are troubled with your distractions in prayer, you can take authority over that. Like if you're praying, I'll squirrel, you know. <laughs> That's most likely what happens when we're praying. We're suddenly distracted by everything in the room and everything outside, right? You know, that's the enemy. But you can do something about it. It doesn't have to be that way. Years ago, our services were just filled with distractions and it was just bothering me. There was just all kinds of distractions, people moving around and noises and sometimes it was children and sometimes it was the water cooler doing weird things, you know. But there was just all these distractions in the room. And I complained to God about it one day. He goes, you know, you can stop those. And I went, oh yeah, I can, can I? And that's why I always start the service the way I do now. We invite the power of the Holy Spirit because we know that as the Holy Spirit is with us, there can be no spirit of distraction in the room. I invited the Holy Spirit and I uninvited the distractions. And as the Holy Spirit is with us, there can be no spirit of doubt or confusion. So I'm removing those spirits and I'm inviting them. You can do the same thing in your own private prayer life. If you're plagued by distractions, just say, I invite the Holy Spirit to come and the spirit of distraction can no longer be in this place. Right? That's how we can practically work around these sneaky distractions of the enemy. If he's distracting you in prayer, just take authority over it. Make it stop. Now let's talk about relationships. All of that was about prayer. Let's talk about relationships. How can the enemy cause spiritual warfare or sneaky attacks on our relationships? We're going to go back to that passage in 2 Corinthians that we started with this morning. This is the context. Remember I said I had kind of ripped that verse out of context a little bit. This is the context. Paul is making a statement about being not being unaware of the schemes of the enemy that is rooted in human relationships and unforgiveness. But we're not unaware. We know how the enemy works. So this is a great example here of what we can do. 2 Corinthians 2.5 <clears throat> If anyone has caused grief, he has not so much grieved me as he has grieved all of you. To some extent, not to put it too severely. The punishment inflicted on him by the majority is sufficient for him. Now instead, you ought to forgive and comfort him so that he will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. I urge you, therefore, to reaffirm your love for him. The reason I wrote you was to see if you would stand the test and be obedient in everything. If you forgive anyone, I also forgive him. And what I have forgiven, if there was anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake. In order that Satan might not outwit us, for not unaware of his schemes. So now do you see the context of this? Paul is addressing an issue in the Corinthian church where there was someone who had caused offense. But then there was an issue of failing to forgive this person. So Paul urges the Corinthian church to forgive the man and to reaffirm their love for him. Then Paul makes this direct connection that unforgiveness and fa failing to forgive are part of those subtle, those sneaky schemes of the devil. Satan is trying to outwit them through their unforgiveness. But Paul says, but we're not unaware of this trick. Why are you failing to forgive him? And the reason Paul is addressing this is because it was starting to cause division in the Corinthian church. They had failed to forgive this man. That gave the devil his opportunity and it was causing division in the church. I have seen this firsthand myself many times in churches. Churches will even split over this idea of holding grudges and failing to forgive. 
So the enemy can, through very subtle means, destroy relationships and ultimately the church through unforgiveness. And of course, this all applies to your family as well, right? Not just the church. So how do we respond to that? How do we outwit the devil? Be quick to forgive. Pray for the other person. And let love win every time. Remember, Paul says, reaffirm your love for this person. Be quick to forgive and reaffirm your love for that person. All right? That's what Paul was calling us to do. Now let's look at emotions. How can the enemy attack us through emotions? Stephen, go to Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4.26. Oh, there goes the font getting small on us again. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Now what's interesting in here, I mean, the NIV says, in your anger, do not sin. Most English translations do something very similar. The Greek says, be angry and yet not sin. The Greek makes it clear you can be angry, just don't sin in that anger. Then in verse 27, Paul makes it clear that letting the sun go down on your anger gives the devil a foothold. And the word in the Greek is opportunity. The NLT version renders it this way. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, for anger gives a foothold to the devil. And we could use the word opportunity, for anger gives the devil opportunity. So, of course, if that's the case, then the devil will do everything he can to get you angry and keep you angry. So when you find yourself angry, give it to Jesus as quickly as possible. When you find yourself angry, be assured the devil is knocking on your door. <coughs> Recognize this as an attack from the enemy, but fight back with Jesus. The minute you find yourself angry, just give it to Jesus. As we look at these different ways that Satan can attack us, of course, there comes this issue of discernment. Remember, we started by looking at 1 Peter 5, 8 that said, be of sound judgment and watch. We are going to have to ask sometimes, God, what is going on? Are you doing something or is this a demonic attack? There is an issue of discernment here of figuring out what is going on and is this a demonic attack? And so often I see demonic attacks happening in people's lives and they're just missing it. And I'm like, hello, like, how are you not seeing that this is a direct attack on your life from the enemy? So how do we do a better job of discerning? I have three thoughts and then we'll wrap up. First, the word of God, right? Does what we hear or sense agree with scripture? This seems obvious enough, but I hear people all the time say, oh, God told me such and such. And I think, no, he didn't. You heard that from Oprah. <laughs> what you just said directly contradicts scripture. I saw a little video yesterday. Somebody did, Bible literacy in our nation is so low, right? Somebody did a Bible literacy test, and they asked some people some basic questions. They asked people, uh, what is Sodom and Gomorrah? And people, most people thought it was the names of two people in the Bible. They didn't know that those were cities. Anyway, the Word of God. It must agree with the word of God and it must agree with the character of God because people will say, oh yeah, the Lord led me or told me to do such and such. So I'm like, no, no, no. That's not even the character or the nature of God. God's nothing like that. We have taken our culture and we have imposed it on the God and we think God must look like our culture. But when we study the word of God and we spend time in prayer talking to him and listening to him, we understand the nature and the character of God. So now it's obvious when the enemy is attacking us because we can see the difference, right? This is the best example I can give you. When people are trained to work in a bank, they're only trained on real money. They're only trained on real money. So if they're ever handed a counterfeit, they immediately know. Right? If we only use this to shape us, we immediately recognize when it's the devil speaking to us or confronting us, right? Because it's going to feel like a counterfeit money to us. Number two, the voice of God. We must hear the voice of God. In chapter 10 of John, 
Jesus talks about the shepherd and the sheep. And the sheep, he says, only respond to the voice of the shepherd because they recognize his voice. We have to spend enough time in the word and in prayer to become familiar with his voice. So that when it's something else, we recognize it. The best example I have is I have a godfather who was a dairy farmer his whole life. I spent a lot of time as a child growing up on that dairy farm. During the day, he'd let his dairy cows go out into the pasture to graze. And then in the evening, it was time to milk. He'd open the barn doors and he would call them and they would come. He'd open the barn doors and he would make this sound. I can't even replicate the sound at all. But he would make this sound. It wasn't really words. He would just make this sound and the cows would just come. Any one of his sons could go and stand at the barn door and make the same sound. Cows wouldn't move. I could make the same sound. Cows wouldn't budge. They wouldn't even turn their head. But if my godfather made that sound, those cows would come and run into the barn. They knew his voice. That's the way it should be for us. We hear and recognize the voice of God. So when some other spirit tells us to do such and such, we say, no, no, no. I know that's not the voice of God. Right? And then number three, the state of our own mind. If our mind is focused on self, if our mind is focused on the world, or if our mind is just sort of blank, it can be much harder to discern between the enemy and something that's not the enemy, right? And it's hard for us to get our minds so singly focused on the Lord because we have so much media constantly bombarding us, right? But if you're focused on yourself, particularly in a negative way, it's going to be way more challenging to hear from the Lord and way easier to hear from the enemy. Those negative thoughts can be a seedbed for the deception of the enemy. This is an active fight that we must constantly win in our mind. And I did a a several part message on that a few weeks ago, looking at 2 Corinthians 10, 4, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have the power to de demolish strongholds, right? You remember that from a few weeks ago? Somebody nod your head and make me feel good about myself. All right, y'all remember it, great. So we win that mind, we win that battle in our mind so that we can keep our mind focused on the kingdom and then we'll understand and recognize the attacks of the enemy. We can't win this war against spiritual warfare until we learn to recognize the ways the enemy likes to attack us. And I gave you just a few examples today from Scripture. Of course, there are many more. But I think it can be boi boiled down to this. First, we have to learn to recognize and discern the attacks. What are, Paul says we are not unaware of the attacks of the enemy. So we need to be able to confidently say, I am not unaware of how the devil attacks. And then two, just fight back with Jesus. Whatever the devil is doing, Jesus already has victory over it, right? It's just that simple. Whatever the devil is doing, Jesus already has victory over it. So just fight back with Jesus, all right? All right, I'll crash and burn and just say amen. I invite the worship team back up.